Can, hey, can you still hear me now? Yes. All right. All right, just making sure because I'm recording at the same time. I just wanted to make sure it was working. All right, so here we go, guys. Chapter 16. Uh, and it's, I will tell you just a little. Yes. Um, they, it was like, it was true because he said, um, I hope they choke on it. Yeah. And I was like, oh. True that, man. Threw it right at him. All right, guys, here we go. Chapter 16. I will tell you just a little. Poor Blossom, Uncle Heinrich said, laughing after dinner that evening. It was bad enough that your mother was going to milk her after all these years of city life. But Anne Marie, to do it for the very first time, I'm surprised Blossom didn't kick you. Mama laughed, too. She sat in the comfortable chair that Uncle Heinrich had moved from the living room and placed in the corner of the kitchen. Her leg, in a clean white cast to the knee, was on a footstool. Actually, the doctor was there, right? Gave her a cast. Yeah. Anne-Marie didn't mind their laughing. It had been funny. When she had arrived back at the farmhouse, she had run along the road to avoid the soldiers who might still be in the woods. Now, carrying nothing, she was in no danger. Mama and Kirsty were gone. There was a note, hastily written from Mama, that the doctor was taking her and his car to the local hospital, and they'd be back soon. But the noise from Blossom, forgotten, unmilked, uncomfortable, in the barn, had sent Anne-Marie warily out with the milking bucket. She had done her best, trying to ignore Blossom's irritated snorts and tossing head, remembering how Uncle Heinrich's hands had worked with a firm, rhythmic pulling motion as she milked. I could have done it, Kirsty announced. You only have to pull it and it squirts out. I could do it easily. Anne Marie rolled her eyes. I'd like to see you try, she thought. Is Ellen coming back? Kirsty asked, forgetting the cow after a moment. She said she'd make dr my dress for my doll. Anne Marie and I will help you make the dress, Mama told her. Ellen had to go with her parents. Wasn't that a nice surprise that the Rosens came last night to get her? She would have had to wake me up to say goodbye, Kirsty grumbled, spooning some imaginary food into the painted mouth of a doll she had propped in a chair beside her. Anne Marie, Uncle Heinrich said, getting up from the table and pushing back his chair, if you come with me now to the barn, I'll give you a milking lesson. Wash your hands first. Me too, said Kirsty. Not you too, Mama said. Not this time. I need your help here. Since I can't walk very well, you'll have to be my nurse. Kirsty hesitated, deciding whether to argue, and then she said, I'm going to be a nurse when I grow up, not a cow milker, so I have to stay here and take care of Mama. Followed as usual by the kitten, Anne-Marie walked with Uncle Heinrich to the barn through a fine, misty rain that had begun to fall. It seemed to her that Blossom shook her head happily when she saw Heinrich and knew that she would be in good hands again. She sat on the stacked hay and watched while, we milked, while he milked, but in her mind was not the milking. Uncle Heinrich, she asked, where are the Rosens and the others? I thought you were taking the Sweden on your boat, but they weren't there. They were there, he told her, leaning toward the, against the cow's broadside. You shouldn't know this. Remember that I told you it was safer not to know. But, he went on, as his hands moved with their sure and practice motion, I will tell you just a little, because you are so very brave. Brave? Anne-Marie asked, surprised. No, I wasn't. I was very frightened. You risked your life. But I didn't think about that. I was only thinking of... He interrupted her, smiling. That's all that brave means. Not thinking about the dangers. Just thinking about what you must do. Of course you were frightened. It was too, today. But you kept your mind on what you had to do. And so did I. Now let me tell you about the Rosens. Many fishermen have built hidden places in their boats. I have too down underneath. I have only to lift the boards in the right place, and there's room to hide a few people. Peter and the others in the resistance who work with them bring them to me and to the other fishermen as well. 
there are people who hide them and help them along the way to Gilles. Anne Marie was startled. Peter's in the resistance? How many of you knew Peter was in the resistance? The newspaper, sneaking around, bringing people there. Yeah. I should have known. He brings Mama and Papa the secret newspaper, the De Fridansk, and he always seems to be on the move. I should have figured that out myself. He is very, very brave young man, Uncle Heinrich said. They all are. Anne-Marie frowned, remembering the empty boat that morning. Were the Rosens and the others there, then, underneath, when I brought you the basket? Uncle Heinrich nodded. I heard nothing, Anne-Marie said. Of course not. They had to be absolutely quiet for many hours. The baby was drugged so that it wouldn't make, wake and cry. So you guys are right. That's what those, that medicine was, was to make the baby sleep. Could they hear me when they talk to you? When I talk to you? Yes. Your friend Ellen told me later that she heard you. And they heard the soldiers who came to search the boat. Henry's eyes widened. Soldiers came? She asked. I thought they went the other way after they stopped me. There are many soldiers in Gilles and along the coast. They are searching all the boats now. They know that the Jews are escaping, but they are not sure how, and they rarely find them. The hiding places are carefully concealed, and often we pile dead fish on the deck as well. They hate getting their shiny boots dirtied. He turned his head toward her and grinned. Anne-Marie remembered the shiny boots confronting her on the dark path. Uncle Heinrich? She said, I'm sure you're right that I shouldn't know everything, but please, would you tell me about the handkerchief? All right, remember, that's what's in the packet, right? The handkerchief. I knew it was important, the packet, and that's why I ran through the woods to take it to you, but I thought maybe it was a map. How could a handkerchief be important? He set the thought file filled pail aside and began to wash the cow's udder with a damp cloth. Very few people know about this, Anne-Marie, he said with a serious look. But the soldiers are so angry about escaping Jews and the fact that they can't find them that they had just started using trained dogs. They had dogs, the ones who stopped me on the path. Uncle Heinrich nodded. The dogs are trained to sniff about and find where people are hidden. It happened just yesterday on two boats. Those damn dogs, <laughs> sorry, I had to read it. <laughs> they go right through the dead fish to the human scent. We were all very worried. We thought it meant the end of the escape to Sweden by boat. It was Peter who took the problem to the scientists and doctors. Some very fine minds have worked night and day trying to find a solution. All right, this part, part literally blows my mind. And they have created a special drug. I don't know what it is, but it was in the handkerchief. It attracts the dogs, but when they sniff at it, it ruins their sense of smell. Imagine that. Henry remembered how the dogs had lunged at her handkerchief, smelled it, and then turned away. Now, thanks to Peter, we will all have such handkerchief, each captain, each boat captain. When the soldiers board our boats... We will simply pull the handkerchiefs out of our pockets. The Germans will probably think we all have bad colds. The dogs will sniff about, sniff the handkerchiefs we're holding, and then roam around the boat and find nothing. They will smell nothing. Did they bring dogs to your boats this morning? Yes, not 20 minutes after you had gone. I was about to pull away from the dock when the soldiers appeared and ordered me to halt. They came aboard searched and found nothing by then of course i had the handkerchief if i had not well his voice trailed off and he didn't finish his sentence he didn't need to bro if she wouldn't have made it they would have got caught yes definitely and probably died or got sent to prison or somewhere or got killed right there if she did not find the packet where mr rosen had dropped it if she had not run through the woods, if the soldiers had taken the basket, if she had not reached the boat in time, all of these ifs whirled in Anne Marie's head. They're safe in Sweden now? she asked. 
You're sure? Uncle Heinrich stood and patted the cow's head. I saw them ashore. They were people waiting to take them to shelter. They are quite safe there. They made it, man. But what if the Nazis invade Sweden? Will the Rosens have to run away again? That won't happen. For the reasons of their own, the Nazis want Sweden to remain free. It's very complicated. Anne Marie's thoughts turned to her friends hiding underneath the deck of the Ingborg. It must have been awful for them so many hours there, she murmured. Was it dark in the hiding place? Dark and cold and very cramped. And Mrs. Rosen was seasick, even though we were not on the water very long. It's a short distance, as you know. But they are all courageous people, and none of that mattered when they stepped ashore. The air was fresh and cool in Sweden. The wind was blowing. The baby was beginning to wake as I said goodbye to them. I wonder if I'll ever see Ellen again, Anne Marie said sadly. You will, little one. You saved her life, after all. Someday you'll find her again. Someday the war will end, Uncle Heinrich said. All wars do. Now then, he added, stretching. That was quite a milking lesson, was it not? Uncle Heinrich, Anne-Marie shrieked and then began to laugh. Look, she pointed, the god of thunder has fallen into the milk pail. I didn't even know it was coming, so I just rolled with it. All right. So, handkerchief part, true story. Man, that's a real part of it. Later in the end of the book, they show the secret of what that drug was on it and what they did with it. Uh, but them hiding them on boats, hiding them in houses, hiding them uh, all over. I mean, I know a lot of you know the story of Anne Frank. Some of you do, some of you don't. I mean, we'd had that read aloud. A lot of you uh, saw that. But, I mean, she hid in the attic, right? They had people that hide hid in a lot of places. Oh, sweet. All right, let's go to 17. All this long time. The war would end. Uncle Heinrich had said that, and it was true. The war ended almost two long years later. Anne-Marie was 12. Church bells rang over Copenhagen early that May evening. The Danish flag was raised everywhere. People stood in the streets and wept as they sang the national anthem of Denmark. Uh, like we say our, our national, like Star Spring, I don't know what theirs is. Every country has their own national anthem. Anne-Marie stood on the balcony of the apartment with her parents and sister and watched. Up and down the street and across the other side, she could see flags and banners in almost every window. She knew that many of those apartments were empty. For nearly two years now, neighbors had tended the plants and dusted the furniture and polished the candlesticks for Jews who fled. Her mother had done it for the Rosens. So what friends do, Mama had said. Now neighbors had entered each unoccupied waiting apartment, opened a window, and hung a symbol of freedom there. You gotta imagine, too, when the Nazis came in, they got rid of all their flags and put up Nazi flags instead. So it'd be like us taking our American flags and putting a Nazi flag up instead. Right? So, so ma hey, exactly, imagine what it looks like now with all their flags back up now. This, now their own flags are up now. This evening, Mrs. Johansson's face was wet with tears. Kirsty waving a small flag, saying her blue eyes were bright. Even Kirsty was growing up. No longer was she a light-haired chatterbox of a child. Now she was taller, more serious, and very thin. She looked like the pictures of Lisa at seven in the old album. Peter Nelson was dead. It was a painful fact to recall on this day when there was so much joy in Denmark. But Anne-Marie forced herself to think of the red-headed almost brother and how devastating the day when they received the news that Peter had been captured and executed by the Germans in the public square of Ravingen in Copenhagen. He had written a letter to them from prison that night before he was shot. It was said simply that he loved them, that he was not afraid, and that he was proud to have done what he could do for his country and for the sake of all free people. He had asked in the letter, to be buried beside Lisa. But, eh, true. But even that was not to be, oh, listen to this part, that was not to be for Peter. The Nazis refused to return the bodies of the young men they shot. They simply buried them where they were killed, 
and marked their graves with a number. Okay, I don't want to know. Later, Anne Marie had gone to the place where her parents had laid flowers there on the bleak numbered ground. That night, Anne Marie's parents told her the truth about Lisa's death at the beginning of the war. She was part of the resistance too, Papa explained. Part of the group that fought for our country in whatever way we could. We didn't know, Mama added. She didn't tell us. Peter told us after she died. Oh, Papa, Anne-Marie cried. Mama, they didn't shoot Lisa too, did they? The way they did Peter in the public square with people watching? She wanted to know. She wanted to know it all, but wasn't certain that she could bear the knowledge. But Papa shook his head. She was with Peter and the other in a cellar where they held secret meetings to make plans. Somehow the Nazis found out and they raided the place that evening. They all ran in different ways trying to escape. Some of them were shot, Mama told her sadly. Peter was shot in the arm. Do you remember that Peter's arm was bandaged in that sling at Lisa's funeral? He wore a coat over it so no one would notice and a hat to hide his red hair. The Nazis were looking for him. Emery didn't remember. She hadn't noticed. The whole day would have been a blur of grief. But what about Lisa? She asked. If she wasn't shot, what happened? From the military car, they saw her running, and they simply ran her down. So it was true, what you said, that she was hit by a car. It was true, Papa told her. They were all so young, Mama said, shaking her head. She blinked, closed her eyes for a moment, and took a long, deep breath. So very, very young, with so much hope. Now remembering Lisa, Anne-Marie looked from the balcony down into the street. She saw that below, amid the music, the singing, and the sound of church bells, people were dancing. It brought back another memory, the memory of Lisa so long ago, wearing the yellow dress, dancing with Peter on the night, and then announced their engagement. She turned and went to the bedroom, where the blue trunk still stood in the corner, as it had all these years. Opening it, Anne-Marie saw the yellow dress had begun to fade. It was discolored at the edges, where it had lain so long in folds. Carefully, she spread open the skirt of the dress and found the place where Ellen's necklace lay hidden in the pocket. The little star of David still gleamed gold. Papa, she said, returning to the balcony where her father was standing with the others, watching the rejoicing crowd. She opened her hand and showed him the necklace. Can you fix this? I've kept it all this long time. It was Ellen's. Her father took it from her and examined the broken clasp. Yes, he said. I can fix it. When the Rosens come home, you can give it back to Ellen. Until then, Henry told him, I'll wear it myself. Oh, my God. That can't be That's it. Don't know. Don't know. Finished. Okay. All right. Now, good news is, you know, they did liberate a lot of people. We know we've, you know, six million, six million Jewish people died during this whole war, and others. Um, but hey, hey, it took people like Lisa and like Peter and like Uncle Heinrich to end the. Uh, and Marie and her family to get, you know, to save as many people as we could. All right, is your story real? This is historical fiction, but let's look at the afterward because it's going to tell you what's real and what's, what just kind of goes through what's real and what's made up. So first line says, how much of Anne Marie's story is true? I know I'll be asked that. Let me try to tell you here where fact ends and fiction begins. So Anne Marie Johansson is a child of my imagination that grew from the stories told to me by my friend, Annalisa Platt, to whom this book is dedicated, who herself was a child in Copenhagen during the long years of the German occupation. Right. Uh, I also had a fact, I'm going to kind of skim through it, you know, and you can read through it, I mean, but it's not, some of it's kind of boring. But um, she uh, was uh, always fascinated by Annalisa's descriptions um, of all the stuff she went through during the war and under the leadership of King Christian. Uh, so look, if you go to the third, or at the bottom, it says, So I created little Anne Marie and her family, set them down in a Copenhagen apartment on a street 
where I have walked myself, and imagine their life there against the real events of 1943. Denmark surrendered to Germany in 1940, um, and it was true for the reasons that Papa explained. Uh, the country was so small uh, with no army of any size, so the people uh, would have been destroyed uh, so if they tried to defend themselves. Um, Soldiers moved in overnight, and then for five years, they occupied the country. So they were in their country for five years. Um, they armed with, they, uh, what does it say? They controlled the newspapers, the rail system, the government, the schools, the hospitals. Every day-to-day -day life, they ran every single part of it. Um, uh, at the bottom, it says they did sink their own navy. That was really a true part of the story. Uh, talked about the Jewish New Year there. They did. They went to the synagogue, as the fictional Rosens did, uh, where the rabbi and they were taken to be relocated by Germans. So that part was true. They went to the synagogues, got a list of people, and then started attacking them and going to get them. Synagogue looks just like a church. Um, so some Jews left right away because they were scared. Some waited around because they didn't think it would happen. So some were captured and some were free. Um, they said a lot of thousands were smuggled across the sea to Sweden. All right, so here's about the handkerchief. This is the bottom of page 135. It says, the little hand hemmed lined handkerchief that Anne-Marie carried to her uncle, surely something made up by the author? No. The handkerchief is a well part of history. After the Nazis began to use police dogs to sniff out hidden passengers on boats, Swedish scientists swiftly... Swift uh, scientists work swiftly to prevent detection. They created a powerful powder compo composed of dried rabbit's blood and cocaine. The blood attracted the dogs, and when they sniffed it, the cocaine numbed their noses and destroyed it temporarily, their sense of smell. Almost every boat captain used such permeated handkerchiefs, and many lives were saved by the device. I don't know. If, I don't know. What, I don't know. Uh, it says the secret operations that saved the Jews were orchestrated by the Danish resistance. Peter Nelson, though fictional, represents the courageous and idealistic young people, so many that died at the hands of the enemy. Uh, keeps kind of going more, a little bit now more. Uh. All right, so there really was a young man that died and was executed. And he, this is his real letter that he wrote. Here's what he wrote. So he said, so he wanted to... Uh, this was, paragraph was written by a young man in a letter to his mother the night before he was put to death. So this is like the real life kind of Peter Nelson. He said, and I want you all to remember that you must not dream yourselves back to the times before the war, but dreams of us for all, young and old, must be to create an ideal of human decency and not a narrow-minded, a prejudiced one. That is a great gift of our country hungers for, something every little peasant boy can look forward to, and to feel pleasure, to feel part of something he can work and fight for. So surely that gift, the gift of the world of human decency, is the one that all countries hunger for still. I hope that this story of Denmark and its people will remind us all that such a world is possible. Yep. I want to read the Willoughby's now. I like that. All right. That is it. All right, I'm going to cut this recording off.